One of the main components of ethnobotany is herbal medicine. This show is about Polynesian herbal medicine. I've divided the lecture into six parts. The first is introduction to Polynesia. That's followed by traditional practices in the Polynesian era, which I'll define later. Changes occurring in the European era, which will also be defined. Contemporary herbal medicine in Polynesia. The medicinal plants and we'll finish up with the efficacy and future of Polynesian medicine. First about Polynesia and the Polynesians. Uh, Polynesia occupies the triangle in the middle of the Pacific with Hawaii at the northern point, Easter Island at the eastern, eastern point, and New Zealand at the southern point. This area is defined as Polynesia and the people living there prior to the European arrival in the area were all Polynesians. They were basically isolated from the rest of the world. The two major regions next to that, which together with Polynesia comprise Oceania, are Micronesia and Melanesia. Micronesia, many small atolls, and Melanesia, mostly high islands. Now, the Polynesians are believed to have originated somewhere in Southeast Asia, perhaps the Vietnam coast. And through a series of sporadic migrations, they uh, unplanned migrations, they uh, went eastward through the islands, first through Indonesia, and eventually through Melanesia, and all these areas were already inhabited, so they had to mix with people there, but as they kept expanding eastward, they eventually came to the end of Melanesia, the end of the inhabited area, and made their first landfall in Polynesia, perhaps 4,000 years ago, and that was probably the island of Tonga in western Polynesia. So over the next uh, perhaps 1,000 years or so, they consolidated in western Polynesia, uh, colonizing Samoa and Wallace Bay of Fortuna, the islands around there. Then perhaps about 2,000 years ago, uh, there was a voyaging canoe, probably from Samoa, that sailed east and discovered the Marquesas. Uh, this is at least the current theory. And from there they spread out and went up to Hawaii, Easter Island, and down to New Zealand through the Society and Cook Islands. So all these islands in this area that were inhabitable were discovered and colonized by Polynesians at one time or another. Most of this ex age of exploration finished a thousand years ago. So here the Polynesians found their own homeland free of other peoples, and so they were basically isolated except for contact on the west between Tonga and Samoa with Fiji and Melanesia. And they were left to develop their own uh, culture independently of outside influences. So um, what are the traditional medicinal practices in the Polynesian era? Um, that's the second topic here. Uh, the medical problems I've divided into two groups, ailments with obvious causes and ailments lacking obvious causes. The ones with obvious causes are physical injuries, digestive tract ailments, ailments of babies, and infections, whereas those lacking the obvious causes are internal ailments and inflammation. Now these can be divided this way because these injuries or ailments were treated differently, and I'll explain that uh, shortly. Physical injuries were a major part of Polynesian uh, medical practices. Uh, there was a lot of warfare between islands or groups of islands. Uh, people would fall out of coconut trees, just get hurt doing their everyday work. So a large part of the treatment, um, Polynesian medical treatment, was for these kinds of physical injuries. Uh, broken bones were treated by specialists a specialist healer called bone setters in most of the Polynesian islands. And physical injuries were also treated by massage, which I'll mention uh, but not in much detail because that's not really uh, too much into herbal medicine. Uh, digestive tract ailments, so these were a very common uh, problem, food poisoning by eating uh, bad food. One type of this is called Cicutera, which is a uh, fish poisoning uh, caused by eating reef, certain reef fish at certain times of the year that eat uh, poisonous algae and becomes biomagnified and when people eat it they get very sick from that. So that's one type of food poisoning. But in general Polynesians uh, treated 
these uh, digestive tract ailments with purges. Now, coconut oil works as a purge because it cleans you out. Uh, but they also had medicinal plants such as Ipomoea indica, which was very popular in Hawaii. And each island group, uh, particularly the high islands, had some kind of a poisonous plant that when ingested would cause uh, diarrhea to clean out your digestive tract and, and cure, hopefully, the uh, food poisoning problem. Ailments of baby. Babies uh, tend to have a lot of uh, ailments that adults have, uh, don't have, uh, such as thrush, which is, uh, uh, is anal thrush and uh, oral thrush, which are uh, fungal infections of the uh, mouth and anus, and uh, colic, which is sort of fussiness. And uh, these were probably treated uh, since ancient times by women healers. Now virtually nothing is known about this because the early writers probably specialized more in the more dynamic part, more uh, flamboyant parts of Polynesian medicine, the, the priest healers. And so, and they also probably didn't tend to associate with uh, women doing their everyday work. And this would be a part of just everyday um, work uh, because the healers, women healers, were probably not specialists. So very little is known about this. We just have to draw conclusions from how it is practiced today. Infections were another major problem. Uh, all of Polynesia except Rapa and uh, New Zealand are tropical. So in tropical condition, conditions you have uh, a lot of rainfall, high humidity, heat, and often a lot of flies. And this uh, is very conducive to skin infections. And you can see by this picture, uh, boils. Boils are an everyday occurrence in, in Polynesia. And treatment of skin infections, since this is an obvious thing, uh, everybody could tell it's just a, something a cut on the skin, so they treated this with folk medicine using simple leaf extracts. Internal ailments, this is the first of the ailments of, uh, that were a mystery to Polynesians, what caused them. Uh, and they were thought to be caused by evil spirits, demons or ghosts, whatever you want to call them. So the, because the cause were the supernatural causes, the treatment was supernatural, and it was aimed at exercising these demons. This was done uh, with massage sometimes, but particularly with herbal medicines that were applied externally and internally. Uh, they, Polynesians believed that ghosts were repelled by certain smells of plants. So some of them are obvious to us, some of them don't smell so bad, but the Polynesians still believe that these, for some reason or another, were uh, repulsive to these uh, ghosts. And so the idea was that if you rub the body uh, with these medicines, it would drive the uh, demons out of the body. The other type of uh, inf uh, ailment that was not, had, didn't have an obvious origin is inflammations, and these were very common, and of course they had no obvious causes. Um, these were also treated with supernatural remedies. Uh, the worst of these uh, inflammations is probably filariasis. This picture is a condition called elephantiasis, which is a physical manifestation of late stages of filariasis. It's, uh, filariasis is caused by filarial worms that are the eggs of which are transported uh, from person to person by mosquitoes. And when these filarial worms get in your body, sometimes you have high fever, but eventually these worms may block up the lymph nodes, which are lymph vessels that return blood, or the uh, liquid part of the blood to the blood system and causes the swelling of, of the uh, limbs. So it is a real problem. It was found through most of Polynesia except Hawaii, which uh, Hawaii lacked mosquitoes, so they didn't have this disease. So the types of healing that was done in the ancient times, I divide this into four categories. Folk medicine, which is practiced by anyone, used for simple ailments. Pediatric and adult medicine, this is practiced by healers, mostly women, at least nowadays. Massage, which is practiced by anyone, but bone setters, I mentioned earlier, were mostly, uh, were specialists and they were mostly men. And uh, the treatment of ailments caused by evil spirits is practiced by witch doctors, mostly men. This is the same pattern throughout Polynesia. So the third category I want to discuss is changes occurring in the European era. Now the Polynesian era I've defined as the time from the first discovery uh, in Polynesia, probably Tong about 1000 BC, up until the time of the European uh, dominance in Polynesia. Now the, Polynesians, uh, the Europeans first arrived in Polynesia about, I think the first landfall was in 1595, but most of the, all these trips after that were just passing through. But the, Poly the Europeans started arriving and colonizing in the, in the late 1700s. So I pick an arbitrary date of about 1770. So the European era is after 1770, the Polynesian era is before 1770. 
And this is a picture of the Bounty, which was a ship that arrived in Tahiti in 1789. So with the introduction of the Polynesians, the dominance of the Polynesians with this European era, things drastically changed for the Polynesians. Um, and one of those things were communicable diseases. Uh, in the previous time, previous to this era, there was only two well-known uh, uh, communicable diseases, filariasis, which I mentioned, and yaws. Now, yaws is a skin disease. It's related, actually, to syphilis. It's uh, passed uh, just by contact between people. It's a skin disease. And once you get it, uh, you have an immunity from it. But it was very, almost everybody would get it one time or another, and it wasn't that serious a problem. Never present in Polynesia was were malaria, which uh, doesn't have the correct mosquito vector, and yellow fever, which was never in the old world, it's a tropical uh, South American or Central American uh, disease. But with the European uh, advent into the islands, all kinds of diseases arrive. Mumps, measles, tuberculosis, leprosy, dengue fever, venereal diseases, and possibly even the common cold. Now, to the Europeans, these are fairly minor diseases. At least some of them are minor, at least not fatal immediately, uh, because they were exposed to these for many generations and they built up an immunity. But the Polynesians had no immunity to these diseases. And so when they were attacked by them, and they were infected by them, uh, these were very fatal, and these wreaked havoc, havoc on the Polynesians and the populations, and the populations of each of the islands groups plummeted every time a new plague came through. And traditional medicinal practices uh, were totally incapable of treating these diseases. And because the gods and the priest healers were ineffective in their healing, they were replaced by uh, Christianity and more modified traditional beliefs. So they weren't entirely new beliefs. I mean, they were new beliefs introduced, but the traditional medicine just changed by the introduction of a number of new um, factors. Now, the, the changes were on these on different types of medicine. The folk medicine, uh, the same medicine practices were used, but there were many new medicinal plants added. Many of these were much more effective because they'd been tried elsewhere in the world. The pediatric and adult medicine remained basically the same, but again with many new remedies, new medicinal plants. The size remained basically the same. The one, biggest change occurred with internal ailments. Those were the believed to be reduced by evil spirits because Western medicine had medicines for some of these things. So this aspect was largely re replaced by the term by the uh, Western medicine. Now going on into the, the fourth part of this lecture, the current uh, practice of herbal medicine, how it operates today. And this is based on a series of interviews I did over a 10 or 15 year period with about uh, uh, almost 100 uh, Polynesian healers. Now, uh, nowadays, the medicinal practices in these places are amalgam of Eastern and Western practices, traditional and uh, European practices, and even Oriental practices. So traditional medicine is still very strong, but it's highly modified in most of these island groups. And many of the traditional plants have disappeared. Western medicine, in the form of doctors and hospitals, coexists now with the traditional medicine. And there seems to be a dichotomy among the Polynesian healers and diseases, because they often stick to treating their own diseases that they're familiar with, that they're always in Polynesia. And the new diseases, they often leave to uh, Western medicine. So there's a, a dichotomy. Both as doctors sometimes send their patients to traditional healers and vice versa. Now, in this first category, at least I want to explain these in detail, uh, folk medicine is uh, practiced by anyone. So the medicines they use are common everyday knowledge. They're not owned by anybody. They're not proprietary medicine. So anybody can use it. No specialist involved whatsoever. Somebody is working on a plantation, cuts himself, he takes some leaves and treats the cut to stop the bleeding and prevent infection. This is a simple example of folk medicine. Now many of the plants used in Polynesia today are modern introductions. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, often it's different plants for the same disease in different places, which I'll, I'll go into momentarily. An example of how this works, uh, for, for cuts for instance, uh, you're cut and you find some the appropriate leaves, you put them in a stack, roll them between your hands, and you get this sort of juicy pulp, and then you squeeze the pulp onto the wound. When I take this first, uh, these first three pictures in this series, um, uh, I, I was talking to the healer, and I said, now we all we have to do is cut somebody, 
and uh, get the last picture of treating the bleeding cut. And we all laughed, and then I drove away, and within an hour and a half, I had stepped off a rock and cut my foot. And just coincidentally, the right plant happened to be there, uh, this mile a minute weed, and so I used myself as for the fourth picture. Polynesian healers have uh, basically the same function throughout Polynesia, and they have different names, but each name, some of the names are related. In Samoa, it's fofo, which is a common term. Talase is a sort of a polite term for a healer. And if the healer is specializing in the treatment of uh, these uh, supernatural diseases, they call them taulaitu, which means the anchor of the gods. Tonga, kaufaito, seems to be a totally unrelated word, even though the two island groups are very closely related. In the Cook Islands, the word for healer is taunga. In Tahiti, it's taua. These are very similar words because the Cook Islands does not have the the H, which is dropped, and Tahiti does not have the G, which is dropped. And in the, the Hawaiian word, kauna la, la'au, la'au, the first word is it's a cognate of the uh, Cook Islands and Tahitian names for, for healer. Now, contemporary healers have a number of characteristics in common. Mostly they're middle-aged women. In fact, probably the 90 or 100 women I talk to, 90% uh, of people, healers I talk to, 90% of them are probably women. And these were mostly trained serving as apprentices. It's usually a mother will, a woman will take her daughter or granddaughter, or maybe even a cousin, but not usually somebody out of the family, only if they can't find somebody in the family that's interested in it. So it's usually a familial kind of apprenticeship. And the healers are not professionals. Some may only treat you know, one or two people a year, some may treat uh, 10 a day, but there's a continuum between them, but not, hardly any of them, only I think I met two that I would consider professional. Uh, so they're just typical housewives most of the rest of the time. They do not receive payment for their treatment, although gifts are commonly given. Uh, it's usually not money, it's usually in the form of food or something, but maybe nowadays it's probably changing and money is appreciated, but it has to be done very politely and not just overtly. These healers believe that their healing art and the medicinal plants that they have are gifts from God, so they can't mistreat that. They believe that if they did this commercially, then they would lose their power. So God has selected them to be healers to their people. They also believe, which is interesting, that uh, they can give somebody permission to use their medicine, make their medicine. But if they do not give that permission, it will not work for somebody else. Now, this worked very well for me in my interviews because I didn't want to use them anyway. So they were very open about which plants they used for what. And I didn't even ask them how they mixed or what proportions. Well, I, I wasn't interested in that. But it was interesting that they trusted uh, outsiders because they don't believe it would work for outsiders anyway. Now, in the healing process, the first step is to make the diagnosis. So a person becomes sick and he goes, he or she goes, or if it's a child, he, is, he or she is brought to the healer. The healer uh, meets with them and uh, does a diagnosis on site and uh, see what kind of symptoms, ask a few questions. If the healer believes that she has a medicine for that ailment, then she will take on the treatment. If she knows of another healer that has it and she doesn't have it, then she will send that person to the other healer. Or if she thinks it's a medicine or a disease that's a Western medicine is better treated by Western medicine, send them to the hospital instead. Um, I ran into one interesting variation of this. It's a modern variation. Card diagnosis. I've, I saw this in two or three islands and they use a deck of cards. And this is obviously a Western idea because cards are a Western idea. Uh, and uh, it was explained to me in more detail at one time, but we don't, can't go into that right now, but it's a very fascinating modern adapt adaptation to diagnosis. So once the diagnosis has been made and the healer decides to take on the patient, the medicinal plants are co collected. Now, either the healer will collect them herself or she may somebody, send somebody in her family to do the collecting. Occasionally, if a plant is not found nearby, she may ask the family of the patient uh, to bring the plant. Particularly if the plant occurs on a different island, she might tell the person to send one of their family members on a different island group to send the plant over and she will do the medicine preparation. This happens once in a while. In this picture, uh, this young man was uh, sent out to collect these uh, leaves for medicine. This woman healer just demonstrates how she takes the fern roots off of the tree. Um, now the plants are typically cut off or broken off, usually cut off from uh, herbaceous plants, but when tree bark is involved, it's scraped from a tree. Nowadays, uh, sometimes a tin can or a knife is used, but these are Western tools. In the old days, it was probably a, a, 
a serrated seashell. And you can see this tree on the right uh, endured many different, uh, many different times. It was uh, scraped for its medicinal bark. Uh, there's an interesting dichotomy between Western and Eastern Polynesia. It's very hard to make categorical statements about the difference between Eastern and Western Polynesia. Eastern Polynesia being the Cook Islands, Hawaii, uh, New Zealand and so forth. Western Polynesia being Samoa Tonga basically. But in Western Polynesia the bark is typically scraped off the tree. In Eastern Polynesia the bark is taken off the tree, cut off the tree and then later pounded. And you can see this uh, Tahitian man on the right pounding uh, some bark that he's taken off of the tree. Now the mem these remedies uh, are, have always been memorized in the past because Polynesians didn't have written languages. But nowadays, once in a while, the healers will write these in a book. I only saw two of these books on all my studies, so it's not very common, or at least it's not commonly related to visiting, inquiring scientists. So the third step is the preparation of the medicine. These three pic pictures show a traditional preparation. The woman on the left is using a wooden bowl and a rock for a mortar and pestle to grind up the, the herbaceous uh, uh, leaves or the, the leaves or the herbaceous plant material. The woman in the middle uh, is in Samoa. She's demonstrating how so sometimes she uses a large clamshell and a rock to uh, grind up the medicine. And the woman on the right in Tonga uses a, a rock or a stone mortar and pestle. Modern implements are also used commonly now because sometimes they're better. This woman in the Cook Islands has found that that half of a plastic, half of a, or half of a plastic uh, fishnet float, Japanese fishnet float, works very well. She's using a cone shell to crush the plant material, and the woman on the right is using a knife to cut up uh, material. Obviously, it's Western because they didn't have any me uh, metal in ancient Polynesia, nor did they have boards because they had no way of cutting them; they're very flat. Now, medicinal plant material is usually used immediately and not stored, but once in a while when it is stored, it's wrapped up in, in a leaf, or a moist leaf, and hung up to dry, uh, hung up, and wait for a day or two until it's needed. So uh, you rarely have dried plant material used in Polynesian medicines. So you rarely have it sold, it's collected on the spot and used on the spot. Now, uh, it's prepared this way typically, uh, and it, at least traditionally, the herbaceous material or the ground up uh, bark is put into this fabric material which comes from the base of a coconut tree. It's tied into a bag and then dipped into water and squeezed into the water. Then you have the either the medicine, if you only squeeze it lightly, the medicine is still in the bag or it becomes imbued into the uh, medicine in the cup. Uh, nowadays, instead of that uh, fabric type of material, they, they use actually cloth or gauze because these are readily obtainable and can be reused. It's much easier to get, especially if you don't have any coconut uh, trees in your yard. The fourth step, the medicines are given uh, internally to uh, the patient. Now these can be taken if the patient is old enough. In this example, the Tongan boy is drinking the medicine. And on the right, the baby is obviously too young to take the medicine, so that medicinal bag that was dipped in the cup, soaked with water, is then squeezed into the baby's mouth. There's a variation on this. Sometimes eye drops are used. This is not very common, though. And the healer that demonstrated this told me that she used it just for the eyes because that was for treatment for ghost medicine. For some reason, I think that the ghosts were believed to go in through the eyes or come out through the eyes or something like that. But it's not very common. Uh, but, and this wasn't even a treatment for the eyes, per se. And uh, sometimes the medicine is rubbed into the mouth. This woman in Tonga is uh, rubbing the medicine. I think it's actually Samoa, is rubbing a medicine into that baby's mouth for a treatment of mouth sores. Now, external medicines are, are rubbed onto the body. This one on the right is actually aloe vera, which is a recent thing, and so the, the plant itself is rubbed. But typically, uh, external medicines are uh, mixed with uh, coconut oil because it sticks better to the skin, and sometimes it's either just put on or massaged on, or sometimes put under uh, like a bandage, a large bandage. There's a very interesting uh, traditional medicine. This was reported in, in Samoa in 1840 and elsewhere in Western Polynesia where um, uh, bamboo leaves were burned and the ashes were mixed with coconut oil and this was used to treat burns. So this practice is still current 165 years later. So it's a very traditional medicinal practice. Sometimes even uh, large grasses rather than bamboos are used. 
Uh, massage is an integral part of Polynesian medicine, and you can see in this woman is giving a massage to this man uh, while Mrs. Doubtfire looks on. He probably has uh, diabetes or something like that, and uh, this child is uh, getting a massage with some kind of coconut oil uh, infusion. Uh, there's basically three kinds of massage recognized in Polynesia. In Western Polynesian, these are called uh, uh, Milo Milo, which is a soft rubbing, uh, uh, a sort of a kneading, which is called uh, uh, Lomi Lomi, which is a Hawaiian word for type of uh, fish that's sort of macerated. And the third in Western Polynesia is called Tuki Tuki, or Tuki Tuki, which is vigorous pounding. So these are the three basic types. They're called by different names in different parts of Polynesia, but those are the three basic types. Uh, massage is very popular for outsiders, visitors to Polynesia, but uh, massage always is popular with everybody sometimes. You can see this child is not really happy with this massage she's getting uh, from this uh, American Samoan healer. Now sometimes strong smelling, uh, strong smelling uh, plant material or even tea leaves are used because these are believed to have special healing effects. Uh, which is part of ghost medicine, which I'll be mentioning shortly. Uh, sprains of broken bones were treated traditionally. Um, it's not really clear in most islands how this was done. Uh, in Tonga now, this uh, man had an injured knee, and some leaves were put under onto the knee and wrapped up with gauze. And this uh, Samoan healer on the right uh, demonstrated how she uses a splint made of a midrib of a coconut frond and then would wrap this up in the material. She uses cloth, but probably in the old days it was tapa cloth. Uh, sometimes there's uh, the sheath, the woody sheath that goes around the inflorescence of the coconut is used on small arms because you can just fold it apart and put the arm in. It's very easy to immobilize a, a broken arm that way. And the last step in medicine, uh, partic particularly uh, if it's very traditional and uh, a series of, of treatments, is called the closing treatment. And this is usually a bath of some special medicinal plant. It has some kind of supernatural significance. This woman on the left was getting a treatment probably from beech uh, infusion of beech pea, uh, which has medicinal properties, which I'll mention shortly. And the girl on the right, uh, it was some kind of medicinal plant, perhaps uh, what the tamani, or the kamani, the Hawaiian kamani. Uh, steam baths were probably used, but there's very little written about it. It wasn't done very often. The problem is the difficulty of boiling water, because Polynesians did not have any pots to boil water. So this was done probably by uh, having a wooden bowl full of the medicinal plants and then hot stones were put in which caused the steam and then the person would sit over the steam and close with a tapa cloth as being demonstrated here in Tonga. Uh, the right at the demonstration of Samoa, the woman that's actually wrapped up in a, a blanket and then uh, would be surrounded by these traditional mats afterwards. Another one I just have to mention, it's so, very interesting, I found it in two different parts of Western Polynesia. It's treatment for anal thrush involving smoke. In both cases, the healers told me they use a, a, a twig of breadfruit, a hollow twig, and it's lit, and then the smoke is blown on, blown on to the anus of the baby. Now, I've mentioned this word several times, ghost sickness. Uh, that's sort of a way of saying it's supernaturally induced uh, ailments. Uh, typically, people call it ghost sickness. And these, there are two basic types recognized. One is the possession. This is a mental type. It involves bizarre behavior. And often the person is like he's possessed and he'll be talking in the voice of a deceased person. This typically involves uh, a, a, an elderly lady that's died and uh, she is talking through one of her uh, female relatives, uh, a daughter or a granddaughter, and she may be complaining about something that her gravesite's not being weeded. This is very typical. Most possessions are in fact of women by, by deceased women. The other type is uh, retarded healing. And this is not so obvious. It's usually when a, a, a healer will use some medicine to heal a, uh, a sore leg or something. It's not healing, and then she may think that there's some supernatural component to it. And um, treatment of, of ghost medicine typically involves strong-smelling plants, which I mentioned earlier. And because it's believed that uh, the Polynesian uh, spirits or uh, you can see the name here, uh, Amaku in Hawaii, Tupapaku in the Cook Islands, Tupapau in the... Uh, uh, that's Tahiti, Tevolo in uh, Tonga and Aitu in Samoa. Uh, these ghosts are, or demons, are uh, repulsed by strong smelling plants or plants that they believe are strong smelling to these spirits. 
so the ghost sickness in different places is called different names. Ma'eaitu in Samoa, which exactly means ghost sickness. Avanga, and now it's called Tevolo, which means devil. It's a transliteration of the English word. In uh, Cook Islands, Maki Tupapaku, which means ghost sickness. Uh, Ma'i Tupapau, same name in Tahiti, and the same meaning in Hawaii, Ma'i Aumakua. Now these strong plants, some examples of this. The one on the left is beach pea. This is used in the Cook Islands and Tonga, I know, at least. Uh, it's believed that it repels ghosts. In Western Polynesia, one of the strongest ones, it's a very strong smelling plant in the citrus family. This is Euodia hortensis, sometimes it's called Polynesian or Island Rue. And in Eastern Polynesia, it tends to be plants like a uh, uh, tea plant, which has traditional values that it believes to be very effective in treating uh, supernaturally induced ailments. Uh, there's a couple of interesting uh, side treatments. This woman on the left demonstrated to me how she does a chant and threatens this person's head, actually a spirit inside the person's head with a pair of she uses butter knives, but this exact same treatment was described in about 1840 or 1850 in Samoa. So it's very interesting. This is the only healer that ever told me she used this, and so it is this just the carryover of this traditional practice. The woman on the right uh, is treating a baby for some kind of ailment, and what she does during the treatment, or at the end of the treatment, she puts the baby on this mat and pulls it around her th several times in a certain direction. It doesn't work in the opposite direction. It has to go in a certain direction which apparently is clockwise looking from above. So it has this supernatural component to it. She also may give the child medicine. Next to the last part are the medicinal plants that are used. Um, nearly all medicines in some, all traditional medicines are made of plant material, fresh plant material. The exceptions in Eastern Polynesia are sugar, but this is used mostly as uh, just to mask the bad taste. It doesn't have any healing properties, and salt is sometimes used in Hawaiian medicines. Uh, typically, leaves and bark are used. Uh, fruits and roots are not used as much, nearly as much. There are sometimes special ru rules for collecting medicinal plants, such as the time of collection. Sometimes they're collected in the morning when they seem to have more power. Who may collect them? Uh, maybe it has to be an innocent child. They're all different values, but this is not common, but it is uh, some of the more uh, for traditional healers. There's also an interesting aspect called valence of a plant. Uh, I've seen this in Tahiti and the Cook Islands, and the healers there believe that certain species of plants have two varieties, a male and a female. This has nothing to do with botanical terms male and female. For instance, on the left you have the Tahitian gardenia. The one with seven petals is believed to be male by some healers, and the one with six petals is believed to be female. Now, I've seen a lot of them with eight, so I'm not quite sure how that works. But the flowers are used differently. Some ailments require the six petal kind, some the seven petal kind. The second example is a uh, member of the Polygonaceae, that's Polygonum uh, dichotomum. Uh, some, some of the plants have two little red spots at the base of the leaf, and these are believed to be the masculine, the male plants. And in the Cook Islands, you have a picture of two miro, or miro fruits, milo in Hawaii. You see the calyx on one of them is entire, it's not split, that's the male. The one on the top has a split calyx, that's the female, so these are used differently. So these are called, the term for this is called valence. Now, all plants in Polynesia can be divided into two types, native or introduced. The native plants are the ones that were originally there. They arrived naturally, such as by bird transport in bird stomachs or on bird feathers or by seawater uh, dispersal. Alien plants are introduced, and if, uh, so they're not natural in the area. They were brought by humans accidentally or intentionally. Accidental ones are often termed weeds. The intentional ones are often termed crop plants or useful plants. Now this can be further divided, the aliens can be further divided into Polynesian introductions, those brought by Polynesians before about 1770, and modern introductions which are were introduced to the islands after about uh, 1770, sometimes by European, usually by Europeans, but sometimes by uh, Polynesians traveling on European ships. Examples of native plants used in uh, Polynesian medicines are this one. This is a Geophila repens. The leaves are used for treating baby ailments. Um, hibiscus tiliaceus has a number of uses. One of them, the sap, is believed to help women uh, give birth because it's slimy. It's supposed to lubricate the birth canal. And there's a number of uh, medicines, medicines from different island groups. The uh, 
this uh, Polynesian banyan, uh, Ficus prolixa, usually the uh, hanging aerial roots are used. The uh, second set of plants, these slides here are of uh, Polynesian introductions, accidental introductions, um, well, possibly, no, intentional introductions uh, instead of native plants. The uh, one on the left is Oxalis corniculata, it's in the wood sorrel family, Oxalidaceae. Uh, small leaves, typically baby elements are treated with herbaceous species, small leafed herbaceous species. The second one is Solanum americanum, it's in the Solanaceae, the potato family, black nightshade sometimes it's called. Um, it's not clear how it got to Polynesia since it's originally named from Americas. Could be native, maybe a Polynesian reduction. It was one of the most useful of all uh, Hawaiian medicinal plants used for treating cuts and so forth. The third one is a variety of uh, red hibiscus. It has the short petal flowers that hardly open at all, very dark red color, used mostly in Western Polynesia and Tahiti uh, for various kinds of medicines. So these are examples of uh, intentional introductions or introductions. Another one that's an introduced uh, Polynesian introduced plant is uh, the noni, the uh, Indian mulberry, called nonu in Western Polynesian, uh, nono in um, Eastern Polynesia, except for Hawaii, which is a noni. And it's used, for example, for treating uh, this ailment. You can see the uh, boy on the right has a sty on his left eye, above his, uh, his right eye. And that's treated, interestingly enough, by the flower, which just squeezed near the sty in Samoa. In Tonga, they just squeeze the leaf, but they don't actually touch it to the sty. This plant, uh, Indian mulberry, was the most widely used Polynesian medicinal plant used everywhere where it was found for various, various things, usually the leaves used for treating boils, uh, co causing boils to come to a head, and for ghost medicines. Uh, turmeric. Turmeric was another medicinal plant. It's uh, a powder, yellow powder, is prepared from the root and it's mixed with oil uh, and it's rubbed on the mouth sores. It's a very common treatment for ailments of uh, uh, for thrush and things like that, mouth sores. Three examples of uh, modern introductions, uh, medicinal plants. The one on the left is the guava. Uh, the le young leaves are used for treating diarrhea. Uh, the middle plant uh, is uh, Senna alatus in the uh, pea family. Uh, the leaves contain prussic acid and it's known throughout the Pacific Islands for uh, its use for treating uh, skin infections. So it actually works. The prussic acid uh, kills uh, uh, skin fungi like ringworm. And the third plant uh, on the right hand side is a uh, myelominate weed. It's in the uh, sunflower family Asteraceae, uh, the most commonly used medicinal plant in Samoa, uh, used for cuts and so forth. Aloe vera, which is very popular in Hawaii. Many people thought it was a traditional plant, but it wasn't first introduced to Hawaii until uh, the 1930s or so. It is biblical uses, uh, I think as a, as a purge actually, and uh, getting increasingly popular in other parts of Polynesia, but sometimes for things like cancer, which was never uh, a use anywhere else. Now the last part of this lecture is the efficacy and future of Polynesian herbal medicine. Now uh, a lot of these, only a few of the medicines actually, are used locally in a commercial scale, because I mentioned earlier that uh, it's against the principles of these Polynesian healers to make money on it, but once in a while an herbal remedy, uh, folk medicine, is commercialized locally. The one on the left is a thing called Malke Miracle Oil. It's made from a, a weed. It's actually a European introduction to the Cook Islands, the island of Malke, Tellinium patens in the uh, Portugal Acacia, I believe. Uh, it's mixed with coconut oil and it's believed to uh, mir miraculously cure cuts. Uh, I've only seen it sold on the main island, the Cook Islands, and this picture is 15 years ago, so I'm not quite sure what's happened with that one, or if it's been ever exported or anything. The one on the right is Tongan Market, uh, where you see this medicine made from various boiled tree barks for treating an ailment called kahi, which is a Tongan ailment believed to be something broken inside. So this, this medicine, very strong with all these tannins in it, but you can, you can buy it in the marketplace and treat yourself sometimes. But these are one of the few examples uh, of local commercial use of uh, herbal medicines. Now, an interesting one is uh, the noni plant. This was... Uh, the, the uh, sort of the medicinal name now is called Tahitian noni. This is probably the, the snake oil of the uh, current times. Uh, it's sold in these bottles, like on the right, that's not actually the brand, for maybe $40 a bottle. And it's uh, touted 
as being a cure-all practically. They don't really say what it works for, but they imply that it's, it's good for almost anything. You have all kinds of testimonials. But in actuality, it's been very little proven that it works for anything. And the interesting thing about it, the company that uh, engineered it, uh, they call it Tahitian Noni. That's not a very good name because Noni is the Hawaiian name. It's not the Tahitian name. They should have called it Tahitian Nono, but that doesn't sound like a very good advertising ploy, so they named it Tahitian Noni. Uh, but it's got really, uh, it's got really carried away. There's a lot of actually uh, local brands of this now in the islands, but there's even things like doggy shampoos, shampoos, soaps. You see these examples that I, I, I found at a, a conference on Noni in uh, Vanuatu a few years ago. So it's really gotten out of hand, but still there's no proof that it works for anything, uh, but they sort of imply it works for everything. Uh, one of the most interesting plants, probably the most effective plant taken out of Polynesia for medicine is the kava, which is Piper methysticum. Now it was not used in the same ways nowadays in commercial medicines as it was in Polynesia. It's mostly probably used as a painkiller, but it's actually just a drink, for ceremonial drink. But nowadays, uh, particularly in Europe, they make uh, medicines for inducing sleep and it's painkillers and tranquilizers so it is very effective but recently there was a scare that it might cause cancer or something and so for a while the sales were knocked back but I think it's been recovering from that when it proved that it, it, uh, it's not that harmful it's not harmful at all probably and uh, one other example uh, this is a tree called Omithlanthus nuttans it's in the uh, Spurge family uh, a famous ethnobotanist was working in Samoa and he collected a number of plants that might have potential for medicines, sent them for uh, bioassay, and it turned out that this plant had a chemical that killed the AIDS virus. Now, I interviewed perhaps 35 Samoan healers. Not one of them told me it was used for any viral disease, but it was used for something else. It was used for infected uh, cuts or, or for preventing infection from circumcision wounds. But, uh, if you talk to enough healers, so this one healer happened to use it for uh, inflammation called um, yellow, he called it yellow fever, but actually it's just jaundice, it's not inflammation, just yellow skin. So it's not actually a medicine that's being taken uh, with its use, or a plant that's been taken with its medicinal use, but it does have a real potential. It's being tested right now, uh, and its early tests indicate that it may even take the AIDS virus out of the HIV virus out of the infected cells. So this has great potential and it may not be reached the market even if it is effective for several more years. So in summary, the Polynesian, what people call Polynesian traditional medicine now is not really traditional. It has traditional foundation but it's changed a lot because of European introductions of plants and practices. It is alive and well over much of Polynesia, particularly in places like Tonga, Tonga and Samoa. It's very dynamic because it's adding new medicinal plants and sometimes even practices. Often healers now will cap their medicine off with an aspirin. And some of the medicinal plants are disappearing. Some of the plants in Polynesia were cultivated specifically as medicines and they're no longer cultivated, they've disappeared. And some of the native plants that are not sought after so much are, being, are hard to find because of uh, habitat, the loss of habitat, the loss of the rainforest. And finally, few if any of the plants in Polynesia will probably have popular or very important medicine uses out to the outside world. Uh, better places to look are Asia or China, which has a longer tradition of traditional medicine uh, and many more species that uh, are possible medicinal plants. And we'll finish this with one slide of sunset over Polynesia. This is a sunset over Nukulofa in Tonga with the uh, pandanus trees in the foreground.